gorgeous individuals, it's Kav here and today I'm going to be talking about just how much I love A Torch Against the Night by Sabah Tahir. A Torch Against the Night is the second book in the Ember Quartet and the final book of this brilliant series, A Sky Beyond the Storm, is coming out at the beginning of December of this year. Penguin Teen is currently hosting a read-along called the Ember Read-Along where throughout the months of July to September they are inviting readers to read or reread the first three books of the Ember Quartet with them. The book for August is none other than A Torch Against the Night, and Penguin so kindly invited me to help support this incredible book this month. This video is sponsored by Penguin Teen, and I am so very grateful for this opportunity as it allows me to rave about one of my favorite series of all time that I do not talk about nearly enough on my channel. Just a reminder that my Why I Love series is not a series of book reviews. It is literally just me gushing about some of my favorite books of all time. So there will be spoilers for An Ember in the Ashes in this video because I can't really talk about A Torch Against the Night without spoiling the first book, but there is only one section where there are spoilers for A Torch Against the Night. I will have timestamps in the description below if you need to skip that section, but other than that it is mostly spoiler free. Anyway, I I am just so excited to start raving about this book, so let's get right into it. Before I actually start talking about the book though, I just have to mention how brilliant the audiobooks for this series are. The Ember audiobooks were some of the first audiobooks I read, I believe, and this time around I listened to Torch on audiobook as well. The narrators of these audiobooks are just so incredible. They capture the characters and the mood so perfectly that I truly feel completely entranced and completely engulfed in this world. The only issue with them is that they completely raised my expectations for all audiobooks to follow and very few actually reach the level of these audiobooks. So I just said the word audiobooks like a million times, but the message I am trying to convey is if you have the ability to read this series on audiobooks, I highly highly recommend you do because it just completely enriches the reading experience. That said, this was my third the time rereading Torch. I first read it in 2016 or 2017, then I reread it last year, and finally I literally just reread it a few days ago. Yet somehow each time I read this absolute work of art, I manage to find new details that Tahir has intricately woven into the fabric of this brilliant story, and I find brand new aspects of this book that I just fall in love with. This time around, something major struck me that I have not been able to stop thinking about since the very beginning of this novel. This series, whether intentionally or unintentionally, is a series about colonialism. From the beginning of the first novel itself, it is evident how the structure of Laia and Elias's world so closely resembles the foundation of which almost every society across our own world was built. Their entire world, the human world at least, is built on violence. That is the foundation of the society. One thing that I think could easily go unnoticed if you're not paying close attention is how this series perfectly encapsulates the cyclical nature of colonialism and the hierarchical structures within communities itself. It is absolutely impossible to not notice the oppression of the scholars by the marshals as that is one of the most important, if not the most important, parts of this series. But when you pay close enough attention, it becomes evident how there are so many other forms of oppression that exist throughout this world and how there are so many other hierarchical structures between different communities and within communities itself, all of which so closely resemble the colonialist structures that built our own world. Again, I don't know if that was an intentional choice or just an unintentional happening, but now that I have noticed it, I cannot stop thinking about it. Even the main character's story arcs depict that so well. In my mind, the first book is the story of how and why Laia and Elias move forward to be at the forefront of the resistance and the rebellion. It's their origin story. That's how I view the first book. But Torch is 
the action. It is the rebellion and resistance. And while talking about that, I want to discuss the three characters whose point of view we read from in this novel. I will forever, with 100% confidence and certainty, say that Sabah Tahir is the absolute queen of character development and character growth. Full disclosure, when I first read An Ember in the Ashes, and keep in mind I was but a child at the time, I hated Laia. I could not stand her. But the second I read Torch, I fell in love with her character. That's how quickly I managed to grow to love her because of Tahir's incredible character development. In Torch, Laia begins to truly embody the fire that has been within her all along. Her bravery and resilience becomes much more obvious. Now, whether you hate or love or are neutral about Laia in the first book, it is impossible not to commend how Tahir writes her character in the second. Laia's character growth in Torch is simultaneously inspirational and hopeful while also feeling almost achievable and realistic at the same time. It feels like it was the path she was meant to walk. And the thing is, Tahir manages to do this with every single character in this series. In Torch, every single character that we met in An Ember in the Ashes feels like they are exactly where they are supposed to be at this point in their journey. So let's talk about Elias Viterius. Elias has, from the very beginning, been one of my favorite characters of all time. I love him so much and he is also the biggest idiot in the entire world. This entire book, Elias is one of those characters who's constantly like, no, I can't let anyone in and tell them my thoughts and feelings because I'll only end up hurting them. Sir, please just calm down and consider finding a therapist. Okay, so maybe I hate this attitude because I happen to share the same one and I don't want to see my flaws pointed out, but that's besides the point. Elias needs a therapist. I still firmly believe that. Everyone is gonna kill me for bringing these men up, but this thought struck me midway through reading the book and I haven't been able to get it out of my mind since, so I'm taking you along on this journey with me. Elias is the midpoint of William Owen Herondale and James Carstairs. He's right in the middle of them. These three men make up the holy trinity of men. No, but I can actually see at least some level of truth in that. The thing about Elias that I think makes him so captivating, no matter what your opinions on him are, is that he is by no means a traditional male love interest or a traditional male protagonist. In many ways, it can even be argued that he isn't a protagonist at all because he is a morally gray character. And I want to come back to that point of morally gray in a bit, but first I want to discuss Helene and then I'll come back to that point. So Torch is the first time we get to hear from Helene firsthand. And the controversial opinion here, I actually really love the addition of Helene's point of view. Helene is an absolutely fascinating character, possibly even more fascinating than Laia and Elias. And I easily think that she could have a series all on her own. And also I hate her. All of those can exist at once. From a strictly plot-driven standpoint, it is easy to see the use of Helene's point of view because she offers something that no other character does, an inside view of everything that is happening with the Marshalls as she is the only character who is actually there. But I am far more interested in her from a character-driven standpoint, which should surprise no one as I read everything from a character-driven standpoint. The thing about this book is the three main characters or the three voices that we hear from all come from a different level of morality. None of them are purely good. And that can be said for every single character in these books. I don't think that any character in these books can be argued to be purely good, except maybe Izzy. This series cannot be reduced to a tale of heroes and villains because except for a select few, no character actually falls neatly into either category. When you are dealing with morally gray characters and antagonistic characters, it is impossible to not be captivated the entire time. And that's how I feel reading these books. I mean, this was my third time reading Torch, and yet I still felt that same sense of excitement that I felt my very first time 
reading it. I was captivated from the very first moment, completely enthralled in this tale of these really complicated characters. Because the more layers there are, the more stressed and furious I get. So that's how I felt the entire time I read this book and I don't regret it in the slightest. I regret it a little because Tahir is really, really mean to all of my favorite characters. But regardless, I still love the stress that this series puts me through. Also, how iconic is it that the titles of these books represent specific characters in the books? I just think that Tahir pays so much attention to little details, and when you pay attention, you see those details that she spent the time adding into the story. Everything that is a part of this series has a purpose. Another thing I want to mention that that to hear balances perfectly is the balance of fantasy elements in these stories and also the real world aspects. While I have talked about how this series is a perfect resemblance of colonialism, it also has so many fantasy elements, many of which are expanded upon in Torch. Now it feels like their foundation has been built too. Listen, I love fantasy, I love YA fantasy, but rarely does it ever actually make my all-time favorites list. Here we're gonna ignore the fact that my two favorite books of all time are fantasy, we're just gonna put that aside for a second. Fantasy rarely makes my all-time favorites list. The Ember Quartet was one of the first fantasy series to find a spot on that shelf. And I have said since then, and I will say again, that I truly believe that this quartet deserves to be the next big thing. It deserves to get the hype that so many other popular YA series have gotten, because it is that good, if not better. The talent Tahir has as a writer, her intricately woven stories, her incredibly well-developed world, her layered and well-thought-out characters, her captivating writing style, there is so much there and so much of her talent and ability is unparalleled. So give this series the hype it deserves. Now I am going to cover a few spoilery thoughts of my own, so timestamps in the description if you have not yet read A Torch Against the Night. Okay, so this is basically just me yelling at myself. Let me preface this by saying again, this was my third time reading A Torch Against the Night, and yet my one brain cell forgot that Keenan is the Nightbringer, so I found myself liking him for the majority of the novel until things started getting a little weird. And you know, I remembered that there was something not right about him that was in the back of my mind the entire time, but I was just like, no, but I like him. I, I really did that to myself. And it's all my fault because this wasn't my first time reading the book. Now I'm going to go ahead and yell at Elias because that is one of my biggest frustrations in this entire series, this man. So I mentioned earlier how big of an idiot Elias is and I couldn't talk in detail about that because it would get into spoilers. You know what the most idiotic thing he's ever done is? Die. I cannot support that kind of behavior. And the fact that he agreed to be the new soul catcher, this boy condemned himself to a life of eternal purgatory. Why? For what? I hate him because of how much I love him. Why do we always fall in love with the characters that ultimately end up inflicting the most pain upon themselves? I hope one of the ghosts or whatever is a therapist and provides Elias some help. All jokes aside, I really do love Elias's character and I think that he is one of the most well-crafted characters in YA fantasy history, but he's also an idiot. Honestly, all these characters are also idiots because they're still characters that end up sacrificing themselves for other people. All of them just need to take a break and get a good night's sleep and then reconvene after that. That is my advice to these characters. And Marcus's dead brother messing with him does not make me feel any sympathy towards his character. First of all, Marcus killed his brother. Secondly, Marcus has essentially been a torturer his entire life. He's just sadistic. And I had really hoped that he would have gained some brain cells now that he's the emperor and he's actually making decisions for the entire empire, but yet he's still that same petulant child that just wants as much power as he can get. So that's fun. Also, 
I remembered this from the last time I read Torch, but Harper's Hole, I offered to help because I wanted to learn about Elias. I don't understand his character. So you guys share the same dad. Congratulations. I don't see why this is so important to him. Maybe there's something I'm not noticing. I understand why that reveal happened like plot wise, but in terms of a character situation, I still don't care about him in the slightest. The first introduction to him that we got was him torturing Helene. I'm not a huge fan of Helene. That doesn't mean I'm a huge fan of brutal torture either. I just straight up don't like him. He's one of the very few characters that I for no reason dislike. Actually, I think he might be the only one that I just dislike. And I think his relationship with the Commandant also adds to why I feel that way because it just frustrates me that she had at least some degree of a relationship with Harper because he was the son of the guy who fathered her biological child. It just makes me more frustrated because of all the pain and torture Elias has endured because his mother is so cruel. She just murdered her own son and then went out her way just trying to enact a genocide of an entire people. What a woman. And why? Did Izzy have to die? She was so good. She was one of the only truly good characters. Probably the only one other than the children Elias and Laia saved from Cough. I'm upset because right after Izzy and Elias got their first taste of freedom after a life spent in hell, they lost their lives. And for Izzy especially, she had been a slave since she was what, like five? And right after she got out, she lost her life and it makes me very upset. When Laia promised that they'll see Cook again but now Izzy's dead so she'll never see Cook again, I'm so upset about it. They always kill the best characters. It makes me sad. This series is so stressful and frustrating and I love it so much and I'm upset about that. Anyway, I will end this disastrous video on this note. Afia Aranor is the single most important and iconic character to ever exist in media and or literature. And I am right. Okay, cool. That's it. I'm done now. It's almost 5 a.m. So we're gonna wrap this up. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Thank you so much to Penguin Teen for sponsoring this video. I am so grateful for this opportunity. And I'm so grateful to talk about this series that I really, truly love so much and I don't talk about nearly enough. And Ember of the Ashes was one of my first reviews on my channel. The video is no longer up because it was bad. But I have loved this series for a long time and I'm just excited to keep supporting it as stressed and furious as it makes me. I do recommend that everyone who's watching this video read the series because it is so incredible and as I said it's one of the best YA series is if not the best one in the recent past. And now I'm gonna finish up this video. Thank you all so very much for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like and subscribe because that stuff makes me happy. Go ahead and comment down below and let me know if you've read Sabat Tahir's books. And if so, join me in raving about A Torch Against the Night. And if not, tell me how soon you are planning to read it. As usual, all of my social media and my Goodreads will be in the description below if you'd like to follow me anywhere else. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you are having a lovely day or night wherever you are. Please remember that you are beautiful angels of the world and I will see you soon for a brand new video. Goodbye!